Welcome, dear friends, once again to Who is Who in the Bible, Praying with Biblical Characters, New Testament series. When you hold the Bible in your hand, have you ever wondered what its sources were? Yes, we have dealt with the, the stages of gospel formation, stage of Jesus, the stage of the early church, the stage of the evangelist himself. We have seen the mass of manuscripts at hand and how the scholars have got for us the standard text on which we depend even in our own vernacular Bibles. Today we ask a very important question. What sources did the evangelists use in order to write their Gospels. When a student writes an assignment, the moderator is able to grasp or understand his sources because he gives footnotes. It is important for us to know the sources that were at play when the evangelists wrote the Gospels. And that is the study we will undertake this evening. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you, because ultimately for us, you yourself are the source of good news. You are the word become flesh. You have enabled us to read about you in the scriptures that the evangelists gave us. Help us through the power of your spirit to understand these scriptures so that we may in turn proclaim you and your actions. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Dear friends, when we look at the sources of the Gospels that we have, the one question that emerges in our mind is, where did the evangelists get all their material? Yes, they were, they were part of the early church, no doubt. But did, were there real sources, written sources, to fall back on. When we come to the Gospel of Mark, we know today that that was the first Gospel to be written. His sources would have been the oral Gospel of his church. He was considered to be the interpreter of Peter. And that is significant. Whether the Gospel of Mark itself went through redaction is a matter of scholarly debate. We shall not go into that. But what we want to acknowledge is the role of the Holy Spirit who guided the evangelists to the sources before them. In a previous episode, we, uh, you were directed to Dei Verbum, number 19, which told us how the sacred authors wrote the four Gospels, selecting some things from among the many which had been handed on by word of mouth or in writing, reducing some of them to a synthesis, explaining some things in view of the situation of their churches. Their intention in writing was that either from their own memory and recollections, or from the witness of those who themselves from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, they told us the honest truth about Jesus. Literary source criticism treats Bible as literature. It is in the 17th century that a certain person called Richard Simon who drew our attention to doublets, 
discrepancies in content and differences of style observable in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. He said that in view of this, it was difficult to ascribe the entire Pentateuch to just one person, and that is Moses. Scholars, two centuries later, in the 19th century, with growing confidence, came to the conclusion that the Pentateuch had sources underlining it. That in fact, that it was composed of four sources, they said, J-E-D-P, Yahwist, Eloist, Deuteronomistic, and Priestly. This gave rise to the documentary hypothesis. Today, the four sources have been narrowed down to just two, the P source and the non-P sources. Don't trouble yourself over this. Just remember that the Pentateuch is not a unified writing by one person, rather a composition of diverse traditions, P and non-P traditions. What about the New Testament? Today, we deal with the Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels. Similarly, we have to consider the relationship among the three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. How to explain the remarkable agreements and disagreements among Matthew, Mark, and Luke. There is a remarkable complex commingling of agreements and disagreements among these three Gospels. And all the most striking is that the Gospel of John plays no part in this. In fact, Augustine was the first one to consider seriously the relationship among the Gospels. And he said that Matthew was the first Gospel to be written and that Mark had only summarized Matthew. A more serious examination of the Gospels was done by Johannes Griesbach of the, in the 19th century. What did he do? He brought a synopsis of the Gospels. That means the three Gospels in three parallel columns, Mark in the middle, Matthew on the one side, and Luke on the other side. A parallel columns. In this way, you are able to see where the three Gospels agree, where they disagree in terms of sequence of material and the content of material. Now, with regard to similarities or agreements among the three Gospels, what are they? Scholars found regarding sequence and content in relation to John the Baptist, Baptism of Jesus, temptations of Jesus, Jesus' appearance in the public in Galilee and then in Jerusalem, a journey to Jerusalem, that is. And all three of them ended with a passion, death, and resurrection, PDR. The similarity is also extended to particulars of style and language, and sometimes even in precise wordings. But then there were dissimilarities between the Gospels. What were they? The three Gospels were strikingly different from one another. For example, the infancy narrative itself in Matthew and Luke. In Matthew, the infancy narrative, the story is told from the point of, point of view of Joseph. The genealogy of Abraham ends with Joseph who is betrothed to Mary, of whom Jesus is born. But in Luke, the story is told from the point of view of Mary, the annunciation of our Lord to Mary. In Matthew, Bethlehem is the home of Jesus' family. In Luke, it is Nazareth. In Matthew, there is the episode of the flight to Egypt, and of the three magi who visit them in Bethlehem. In Matthew and Luke, 
The genealogies are irreconcilable. Even the resurrection appearances present no uniform tradition. For example, in Luke chapter 24, Jesus appears in Jerusalem. But in Matthew 28, he appears first in Jerusalem and then in Galilee. And in Mark chapter 16, verse 8, where the Gospel of Mark actually ends, there's no appearance at all. The Sermon on the Mount, which is unified in Matthew chapter 5, is found in Luke, in other places and other connections, but still in quite similar settings. Finally, each gospel has unique material peculiar to it alone. Whereas Mark has no infancy narrative as Matthew and Luke have. Now, some noteworthy observations made by scholars as um, regarding agreements and disagreements among the three Gospels, I want you to see on the screen, sometimes some passages are found in all the three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. See the next diagram. Sometimes the passages are found in Mark and Matthew, but not in Luke. Yet another possibility where some passages are found in Mark and Luke, but not in Matthew. But the strangest thing is this, when a passage is found in Matthew and Luke, but not in Mark. Why does this happen? We will answer that question later. The question is how to explain these findings that we have just enumerated. The basic question, therefore, is who is the source? Who is the user? Various theories have been proposed to answer this problem, which has been called in scripture studies as a synoptic problem. Which hypothesis will best explain the findings we have so far. The hypothesis that most scholars use to answer the question of agreements and disagreements among the three Gospels is called the two-source hypothesis. According to this hypothesis, the Gospel of Matthew and Luke were composed of two principal sources. They fell back on two principal sources, Matthew and Luke. And what were these sources? One source was the Gospel of Mark. The other source was the Book of Sayings called the Book Q from the German word Quelle, meaning source. Let me present the two source hypothesis on the screen. You see there the two sources, Mark and Q. They are the sources for Matthew. Again, Mark and Q are the sources for Luke. Matthew has 735 verses from these two sources, Mark and Q, whereas Luke has approximately 585 verses from Mark and Q. The position of the two sources that Mark and the book Q are the two sources for Matthew and Luke has a wide acceptance today. Now, those who do not accept it, do not accept it for a reason. Why? They believe with Augustine that Mark was not the first gospel to be written, but Matthew was. Who said Mark had only summarized Matthew. Another testimony that comes to the defense of the priority of Matthew is from a church elder named Papias, a saint and a bishop of Hierapolis in Asia Minor, who belonged to the second century AD. Irenaeus, Saint Irenaeus tells us that Papias was a friend of Saint Polycarp. I want to give you here now the testimony of Papias. 
Mark was the interpreter of Peter and wrote down accurately, though not in order, that which he remembered of what was said and done by the Lord. Matthew compiled the reports in the Hebrew language and each one interpreted them as best as he could. Now this testimony concerning Papias has been quoted for us by Eusebius in his book, Ecclesiastical History. Let us try to explain the testimony of Papias. To say the least, it is confusing. Why? What does he mean when he says, Matthew compiled the reports in the Hebrew language? The word reports, the Greek word here is logia. What does logia mean? Does it refer to a gospel? Logia actually means sayings or oracles, referring therefore to the sayings of Jesus. Not a gospel. Hebrew language, what does that mean? Does it mean a Hebrew script? There's some difficulty here. Because at the time of Jesus, Hebrew was not the lingua franca of the people. Jesus himself spoke in Aramaic. So did the early Christians. Even the state language of Palestine was Greek with some Latin thrown in. So what was Papias really saying? What was he referring to? Probably he was saying that Matthew composed or compiled the sayings of Jesus referring to the Q document in Greek but a Greek that was riddled with Hebraisms. That means Hebraism is an existence of word plays and idioms that are typical of Hebrew. For example, truly, truly, I say to you, the word truly, truly is a Hebraism, which has been translated so in the English language. But the clinching argument why Papias was not telling us or talking about Matthew's gospel is that when you hold Matthew's gospel in your hand today, it does not read like a translation from an Aramaic Matthew into a Greek Matthew. In any case, 90% of, of Mark has been used by Matthew. 600 out of 661 verses of Mark have been used by Matthew. So there is a clear dependency of Matthew on Mark, which would suggest, therefore, that Mark was the first gospel to be written. And therefore, we come to the priority of Mark. Advocated in the 18th century, Let's give some reasons why we believe Mark's gospel was the first. Both Matthew and Luke follow the Markan sequence closely when they write their gospels. And when one of them rearranges Mark's order, the other conserves it or keeps it. What do we mean? We have alluded to this earlier. I want you to look at the screen. Some passages are found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But some passages are found in Matthew and Mark, but not in Luke. That means Matthew has followed Mark here, but Luke has rearranged his material at this point, or perhaps he has dropped it. Or another scenario where passages are found in Mark and Luke, but not in Matthew. What does that mean? At this point, Luke has followed the Markan sequence, but Matthew has rearranged this sequence. Therefore, you don't find it at Mark in Matthew at this point. The conclusion is that Mark is the source for both Matthew and Luke. We shall now venture into actual comparisons between the three Gospels to find out why we believe Mark to be the first written gospel. Let me read for you Mark chapter 2, verses 3 to 5. And they came 
bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, My son, your sins are forgiven. Take the parallel text from Matthew chapter 9 verse 2. I'll read that for you. You have it on the screen. Matthew 9 verse 2. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. Now what do you notice? In Matthew, you hear when Jesus saw their faith. How did he see their faith? It's only when you compare the text with Mark, you know what Mark has observed. They opened the ceiling, they let down the paralytic through the ceiling down in front of Jesus. And Jesus saw their faith in that action. But Matthew has dropped out that dramatic element. So, for some reason. Or take another example. Mark chapter 6 verse 14a. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Now the parallel text in Matthew 14.1. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus. Let's examine the same passage in Luke 9.7a. Now Herod the Tetrarch heard about all that was happening, and he was perplexed. What do you notice? That Mark has called Herod king. But both Matthew and Luke have called Herod Tetrarch. Why is this so? Because historically, Mark is wrong in calling Herod king. Tetrarch was the designation for Herod at that time, and Matthew and Luke have got it correctly. So, they have corrected Mark, and therefore Mark must be earlier. Another example, Mark chapter 10, verses 35 to 45. Here the sons of Zebedee request Jesus for a favor. And what's the favor? Let us sit on your right and on your left in your kingdom when you come in glory. The same passage is narrated for us in Matthew chapter 20, verse 20. And there, it is not the two sons who come to Jesus. It is the mother of James and John who, come, who comes to Jesus with that favor. Let my sons sit on your right and left when you come in glory. Now in both cases, in Mark and in Matthew, Jesus gives the same reply you do not know what you are asking. In English, the you can be singular or plural. But in Greek, in both cases, it is plural. The question is this. If the mother of James and John is making the request, how can the you be plural? It should have been singular. So what has Matthew done? He has changed the request as coming from their mother, but he has not changed the you into, plu into singular. The reason is that the time when Matthew and Luke were written, in the year 85, both James and John were long dead. That means they were revered personalities in the early church. And how could these two men ask for left and right seats of the kingdom of God? That would be pride. And therefore, what does Matthew do? He makes their mother make the request. But unfortunately, he doesn't change the pronoun into singular. Let us come to some corrections that Matthew and Luke have made when they copied Mark. 
Mark 1, verses 2 and 3. Mark has said, as in Isaiah the prophet, and then he has given two quotations. But when Matthew and Luke copy that same verse, they drop the first quotation. Behold, I send my messenger before your face, or who will prepare your way. Why do they drop that quotation? Because they realize that quotation is not from Isaiah. Only the second one is. They drop, both Matthew and Luke drop that quotation because it is not from Isaiah, but it is from Malachi. So, this is how Matthew and Luke correct Mark. Let us take our last example. Mark chapter 2, verses 25 and 26. And he said to them, Jesus said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry? He and those who were with him, how we entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any, but for the priests to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. Now, both Matthew in 12 verse 4 and Luke chapter 6 verse 4 omit the reference to the high priest Abiathar. Why do they do that? Because when David went into the temple, it was not Abiathar who was the high priest. The high priest at that time was Haimelech. So it's a wrong reference by Mark and therefore Matthew and uh, Luke dropped that reference in, but they retained the rest of the passage. So both Matthew and Luke are correcting the Markan historical errors because it is the first gospel. Let us see now some statistics on the screen. Mark has 661 verses, and Matthew has 600 out of the 661 verses from Mark. Whereas Luke has copied 350 verses out of the 661 verses from Mark. If you remember, I mentioned earlier a strange fact that we alluded to. Sometimes we said the passages are found in Matthew and Luke, but not in Mark. In this case, where did Matthew and Luke get their text from? What was their source? If not Mark, what was their source? Where did Matthew and Luke get their passages? If not from Mark. See on the screen. Here Matthew and Luke agree, but not Mark. There are about 235 verses, dear friends, that both Matthew and Luke have, which are not in Mark. Where are they from? And it is here that scholars think there was another source at play. And they name that source Q because those 235 verses are mostly the sayings of Jesus. So that is the way we come to the two source hypothesis. Mark we have already seen and now we have Q. Now this two source hypothesis has gained a wide acceptance both among Catholics as well as the Protestants. Just as the Markan sequence and content was followed by Matthew and Luke, now you find the Q content is also followed, the sequence and the content are followed both by Matthew and Luke, with, of course, variations, some variations. The last thing we have to observe is that besides these two sources that Matthew and Luke fell back on, that is Mark and Q, both Matthew and Luke have what is called 
unique material in German called the Sondergut, which only they have, which is unique to Matthew, unique to Luke. If you look at the screen, we have this schematically described. Matthew has a total of 1,068 verses, of which 600 come from Mark, 235 come from Q, 235 come from M, which is a unique source for Matthew. You find it only in Matthew. Luke, 1,149 verses, of which 350 verses have come from Mark, 235 have come from Q, and 550 are unique to Luke alone. The special material in Matthew is M, which is a little over 20% of his gospel. Whereas the special material in Luke is about 50% of his gospel. The unique material is found basically in the infancy narratives of Matthew and Luke, which is unique to them. So finally, we have a four document hypothesis, Mark and Q, which are the sources for Matthew and Luke, added to that Matthew M for Matthew, and L for Luke. Dear friends, here in this episode, we have looked at the sources in the composition of Matthew and Luke. In the next two episodes, we will take up two further questions. What we read, we hold in our hands, contains forms. Forms that were found in the oral tradition, connected to their own context, finally found a context on the written page of the New Testament. We will be examining the forms and their context and trying to go back to the actual word of Jesus and the context, if we can retrieve the context, in which Jesus actually said or did something. The next question after that will be the redaction by the individual evangelists who have used these sources. And yet, using these sources, the same sources, but nevertheless giving us four distinct portraits of Jesus. Dear friends, at this moment, I think we have dealt quite a bit. Let us pray. We thank you, Lord, for directing the evangelists to sources. Thank you for our own intellect, our will, our imagination, which is at the service of your word and its proclamation. Bless those who proclaim your saving word all over the world in different ways. May we never tire of you, O Holy Spirit, as you assist us in the actual task of proclaiming Jesus your word. Help us to deepen our understanding of Jesus. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We thank you, dear friends, for being here this evening. It was nice having you. Hope to see you again in the next episode. The forms of found in the Gospels and the context in which these forms are found. Hope to see you then. Good night. God bless you. 